That's Wall by Claude Debussy from book one of the Preludes. A bit of an enigmatic sound. It's titled Wall, which can mean veils or sails. There's some controversy as to what it actually meant. It, uh, it was composed December 12th, 1909, one of the earlier ones. And then Debussy himself premiered it May 25th, 1910, at the Society Musical Independent. Uh, and a very, with two other preludes uh, as well. And so it would have been a very intimate place that it had been premiered, probably a salon somewhere. Uh, people have different ideas about this. Some think that it's Degas sailboats or Louis Fuller, who was a dancer from America who danced at the Fuller Berger, which was an interesting place because Toulouse-Lautrec was often at the Follet's Bégère, uh, near Grand Boulevard. Uh, and Debussy would go there, and he would have been familiar with it. And it would have been rather exceptional because it had electric lights. And electric lights were a big deal around the turn of 1900. You had light, you had color, you had illumination. You could create images and impressions of reality and bend it. You know, we're so used to all kinds of play of light, you know, a hundred years later. But then, it would have been quite exceptional. And so this dancer, she had this uh, veil, the serpent dance that she did with veils, and it was illuminated. And so this made, apparently, quite an impression uh, on Debussy. But then Marguerite Long, who studied with Debussy from 1914 to 1919, and in fact, well, 1918, he died in 1918, um, she, in fact, visited him along the French Basque coast when he was sick, you know, near Bayonne, near um, Saint-Jean-de-Luz, where he had a chalet, chalet Habis, actually. And it was an interesting place to see it. Uh, when he was so, so terribly sick, he apparently had all of his faculties, and she was still able to glean information about Peace's performance practice. And some people discounted it. At other times, she seemed like she was the expert, you know. But, um, she said, and then actually afterwards, she had a very long career teaching at the Paris Conservatoire. So she is, she's an important one. Then after Debussy died, she got to know Ravel. So interesting part of the French piano history. But anyway, Deb she said Debussy often said of performances of Wall, certain interpretations of Wall were too colorful. The piece is not a photograph of the beach or a postcard for the 15th of August. Uh, perhaps it's more muted. You know, he uses the whole tone scale. Very distinctive sound. Some theorists argue that the whole tone scale, because it's all whole steps, is equalized. You know, it's an equalized palette. We don't have the dissonances of sevenths or tritones or even half steps. You know, it's only the whole steps. So perhaps it's less bright, perhaps it's more muted, veiled colors, perhaps it's more like Nuage Gris, his orchestral piece, which was the various grays and blacks and whites. Um, Robert Godet, one of Debussy's friends, said this about Degas and Debussy with the notion that perhaps Degas' pictures of sailboats might have inspired this. Quote, the only painter who was constantly on Debussy's lips at this time was one whom we can be sure he never met, Paul de Degas, and even Degas, the infrequent painter of pastel landscapes. He fascinated Debussy and at the same time gave an example of discipline to his imaginative promptings. So perhaps these gave some structure? I think that's a bit of a leap. We can't really say for certain about that because remember, Debussy did not want to be labeled as anything. He hated being called an impressionist. He wouldn't have liked being called a symbolist after the fact either. So, but who knows? Perhaps these Degas paintings were in his imagination. We have to remember that Debussy was all about the imagination. He wasn't about stating things outright. He didn't want to say, well, I, I saw this and therefore I wrote that. You know, that's not how this works. It's, it's the imagination. It's memories of things that he experienced when he was younger or 
impressions that he got from reading fairy tales. You know, so it's a different, it's a different world, you know. Now, another side of this could be the Javanese gamelan, perhaps. Um, because really, this low B flat sounds like a gong. And the fact that it's written with a staccato and a legato, indicating that it's a tenuto note, this brushed stroke, This was one of the string or membranophone instruments that he that he saw. You know, he went to the Paris Expositions in 1889 and 1900. 1889 being the one where the Eiffel Tower was constructed, and you know, these made a very very strong impression on him and the sound of the Javanese gamelan. So you know, we have other gamelan pieces. You know, we have uh, pagodas being the most classic example. But there are a lot of times he used these gongs in his pieces, and I think that you can make a strong case, plus the fact that it's really the whole tone. You know, it's not really, ever, there's one small section, perhaps, you could theorists say there's one section that's chromatic, but I wouldn't even really go so far as to say that it really mattered. You know, we have these plained... Well, that sure sounds whole tone, doesn't it? <laughs> and people talk about these plain chords, meaning parallel chords. Well, it's, it's right there, right? And then as we go on, sound chromatic, but they're not. They're simply different spellings and inversions of these whole tone, of this whole tone scale, you know. So it's an amazing evocative piece really created with very small, a very small range of materials. It's really this, that whole tone scale, well, whole tone zero starting on C to begin with. So it's quite a piece. One thing I always like to mention, Paul Roberts, not Paul Roberts, I already mentioned him. David Duball, I love this book. I, again, I had it as a teenager. Let's close with what he said about it, and then we'll have a, well, I played this down in TAMU, Texas A&M International University in Laredo, a year ago. So we'll give you a performance of that. Uh, David Duball set of wall, veils or sails. Debussy also premiered this prelude. Yes, he certainly did. The work uses the whole tone scale to great effect. Debussy told Marguerite Long that some pianists played it with too much color, losing the insubstantial feeling he wanted. That's an interesting way of putting it, insubstantial feeling. The idea that you can't quite identify anything, that it's kind of out there and you get colors and impressions of it, but it's not identifiable. Debussy himself saw sailing, quote, sailing boats anchored to a fixed pedal point. Those B-flat gongs, perhaps, of the gamelan, right? As well as mysterious veils enveloping palpitating feminine forms, this Louis Filler at Fuller at the Fuller Bergere, perhaps, hiding eyes which fan desire by their devious glances. Well, we have to remember that this is the Debussy who was very, very closely associated with Pierre Louis and the chanson de billeti, this er fake erotic Greek poetry, that the songs came out of it as well as small chamber works. So there was this whole other side to Debussy. Um, and then 
For some reason, Duval also mentions the composer Edgar Varese said the piece was inspired by the diaphanous veils used by dancer Louis Fuller, then famous in Paris. So you can take whatever we want with it. You know, perhaps it's this dancer, perhaps it's the folie bergere and the lights, and, you know, this evocative, the veils going through these various colors. Perhaps it's the Javanese gamelan and the gongs and the whole tone scales and the various layers of instruments that you get in a gamelan. Or perhaps, you know, it is a sailboat and it is Degas, one of these sailboat images, these paintings. You decide for yourself. <laughs>